welcome to St. Michael's Episcopal Church here in O'Fallon on this beautiful Sunday morning. It's the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. Let's begin our worship together. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and blessed be his kingdom, kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we might perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> of Genesis. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethel, the Armenian Paddan Aram, sister of the Laban Ariman. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah was conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one, the one shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his bloody like hairy mantle. So they named him Asua. Afterward, his brother came out with his uh, hand gripping Asua's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Asua was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Asua because he was fond of game, but Rebecca loved Jacob. Once Jacob was cooking a stew, Asua came in from the field and he was famished. Asua said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, First sell me your birthright. Asua said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? 
Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Asua bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank, and rose and went his way. Thus Asua despised his birthright. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 119, 105 through 112. We will read it responsibly by full verse. Your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon my path. I have sworn and determined to keep your righteous I am deeply troubled. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept the Lord the link to my lips. My life is always in my hands, yet I do not forget your law. The wickedness has set a trap me, but I have not strayed from your commandments. Your decrees are my inheritance forever. Truly, they are the joy of my heart. I have applied my heart to fulfill your statutes forever to the end. from the letter of Paul to the Romans. There is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ, for the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that uh, the just requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk it not according uh, to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, for those who live according to the flesh set in their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set in their minds on the thing of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit. Since the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, through the body is dead because of sin. <coughs> The Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his Spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parable. Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and 
since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what is sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the world, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Christ is in our midst. He is our If Christ came to our world as Jesus today instead of in the first century Palestine, how do you think he would try to communicate? with large numbers of people at one time. Would he still come as a Jew, as a citizen in today's reconstituted Israel? Or has the world changed too much in the last 2,000 years for Israel to be God's optimal approach? Would he make appearances in halftime shows on NFL games or World Cup soccer? It just doesn't feel quite right. Jesus was not terribly flashy. Would he be invited to popular talk shows on TV once the news media caught wind of his healing and teaching abilities? Would he make wide use of social media, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat? How would he dress? Imagine Jesus in jeans and a t-shirt on The Tonight Show or talking to Oprah or Ellen DeGeneres. Who would be today's version of the Pharisees or the Romans? Would Jesus still focus on lepers to make a point of the image of God that remains in people considered to be unclean? Or would he seek out people with diseases and conditions more common today? How many people do we think would still want to kill him or to discredit him? Would he be scoffed at? criticized by our well-known Christian teachers and preachers that fill radio broadcasts and internet streaming with their sermons? There's no way of knowing the answer to such questions, of course. History is what it is. Jesus became incarnate when and where he did for what have to be better reasons than we can imagine. Paul says Christ came in the fullness of time. And surely that has a lot to do with Israel's position in the Roman Empire at that time, making dissemination of the good news fast and easy over distances of hundreds and even thousands of miles. But the scene in which today's gospel teaching unfolds is intriguing. We're taken back to the basics. There are so many people crowding around Jesus on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, also known as Lake Gennesaret, that it's impossible for him to begin teaching where he stands. Only a few dozen people would have been able to hear him there. So he decides to use a boat as a platform and teaches while floating a few yards from shore. Not only can you hear well across water, but the hull of the boat would have acted as a kind of amplifier. 
Would Jesus draw so large a crowd today? He was just there to teach, it seems, although some in the crowd probably came expecting to witness Jesus perform some kind of miracle. There were no other big draws to bring people in, no power boats or water skiers. Jesus did not have his disciples selling cotton candy or elephant ears on the side. He was not talking up coming attractions. No movies were going to be shown when he was finished talking. The crowd had just gathered without a plan in order to see and hear Jesus. Do you think more people would come to church if they thought Jesus was going to be there? Be here? What could be a better draw than expecting Jesus himself to show up in a church service? In Galilee, there were no posters that told people Jesus would be at this location today from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., so bring your friends and come and hear all he has to say. At least we don't think there were posters or handbills. I suppose there could have been. It's possible that the disciples advertised Jesus in some way, but we don't hear about anything like that in the scriptures. As far as we know, people found out where Jesus was by word of mouth. It was pretty low-tech. Of course, the ironic thing for us is that Jesus does show up in our worship services today. So why don't people want to come to see and hear and touch and taste him? At the scene of today's gospel account, a lot more than just two or three hundred people showed up. We know at times Jesus spoke to crowds of four and five thousand men, not counting women and children. So when this passage speaks of a, lar uh, of a large crowd, a crowd large enough to make Jesus want to get into a boat, there must have been quite a few people. Imagine that for a second. Did these people have any idea what they were going to hear? I wonder. Would they have gone to the trouble of coming if they knew that they were going to hear parables that they might not understand? I don't know. But it seems the burden of understanding is not all on Jesus. Much of it depended and still depends on the ears of the listener. Do we have any avid gardeners in the congregation this morning? Show of hands? A few. A few. I know Wynn was big on gardening, and I've heard some of you are into it, so I'm glad to see that. Or at least you used to be into it, some of you who didn't raise your hands. I don't think we have any farmers, though, or ex-farmers. Farmers are getting harder and harder to find in our world, but lots of people still garden. So how do we go about planting things today to make sure that we get a good harvest? To make sure that we get the most out of the seed that we have to plant? The seed's not cheap anymore. We go to a lot of trouble to prepare the soil ahead of time by using a hoe or a rototiller or a huge cultivator if we're on a large farm. We turn the soil to expose fresh dirt. We pull weeds at least big ones. And then we choose very carefully where and how we will place our precious seeds. If we're gardening, we may poke little holes in the dirt with our fingers or a stick and space out our seeds perfectly. If we're planting a large field, we'll use seeding machines pulled behind a tractor that poke holes or lay a furrow, drop the seeds, and cover them up all in one operation. This makes sense to us because we desire maximum efficiency and productivity from the least amount of labor and the smallest amount of seed. But Jesus talks about a very different style of planting in today's Gospel reading, doesn't he? It seems, seems crazy to us, downright wasteful. But the people to whom Jesus is speaking understand perfectly because they did it themselves. 
In Jesus' day, farmers, at least those raising grains like wheat and oats and barley, would sow their seed. Some of us may not know what that looks like, but I'm sure most of you have seen people feeding chickens in a pen, at least in movies or documentaries, <laughs> if, if not in your own life experience. And it's a lot like that. The sower holds a large bag or pot or bowl or basket full of seed in front of themselves with one hand, pressing it against their belly or their hip. And with the other hand, they grab hands full of seed and scatter them systematically by swaying their hand outward in a semicircle as they walk forward, kind of like they're throwing a Frisbee. A person who is good at it ends up with a pretty even distribution of seeds on the ground. If you're not so good, you end up with blobs of seeds in some places and few or no seeds in others. But either way, you don't have much control over where the seed goes. It just goes everywhere. That's how seed was scattered. Then after the seed was scattered, a cursory shallow plowing or dragging of the soil was done to bury the seeds at roughly the right depth for germination. Of course, the seed Jesus is talking about, the one he's talking about spreading and planting in this gospel lesson, is the life-giving word of God. The good news. The gospel. The news that God has made his kingdom available to us right here on earth, right now, and admission to it is free. The kinds of soil Jesus mentions on which the seed lands are the ears and hearts and minds of all the different kinds of people who are listening. If you've been reading Matthew along with our lectionary uh, over the last couple of months, you'll see why Jesus decides to teach using this particular parable on this day in Galilee. The seed that he's been scattering so extravagantly has clearly fallen on a wide variety of soil. Jesus is very aware of the mixed reviews he's receiving as he travels around his country, touching people with God's touch. Many people hear the word of God, but of those who hear it, there will always be some in whom it does not take root at all. That's hard for us to accept. We wish it was not true. So sometimes we try to blame the preacher when God's word cannot be heard. And sometimes that's where the blame belongs. But as far as listeners go, there are some people in whom the word resonates for a while, and it germinates in these people, but then inside them, for one reason or another, after a time, the word dies. The good news dies, or ceases to be perceived as good news, maybe. And so it ceases to grow and to have an effect. Jesus gives a couple of different reasons why these things might happen. While sad, they are understandable. Maybe the preparation of the heart or the mind is still shallow. Or maybe a bird, spiritual thief of some kind, comes along and plucks up the seed that has just sprouted. Maybe the seedling does not receive enough water or warmth. Different circumstances in our lives fit those metaphors. But of course, joy is complete when, in good soil, the seed takes root and grows strong and yields an abundant crop that not only feeds a lot of people, but that produces enough extra seeds to plant an even larger crop in the next season. In fact, we would have to say that joy is complete for the farmer, joy is complete for all those who are fed, and joy is even complete for the plant that gets to enjoy its brief life growing to be the best of what God meant for it to be. It's hard to know if this parable should be called the parable of the sower, or maybe if it should be called the parable of the seed, or better yet, the parable of the soils. We all need to take stock of what kind of soil we are. Can we receive and nurture the good news that falls on us? 
Do we make a place for it and protect it after we've received it? Or do we ignore it, thinking it'll be fine without any attention? Do we fill our lives with weeds that compete with the Word of God, that rob our little baby Christian seedlings of the light and water and nutrients that they need to become strong and fruitful? Obsessing about cares of this life or focusing on money, all of which are necessary concerns to a point, and it's easy for us to do that. Those things can plant weeds beside and around the seed of, of God that needs our attention. Who in their right mind waters and fertilizes scatter the word so, so often that he gets into all the crack and maybe a little over there where we know or the barn and keep it for a rainy day. That's not the kind of sower that Jesus is. Jesus is not economical when it comes to the good news. He throws it everywhere. He does no demographic studies recommending that he target only that portion of the local population that's most likely to respond to his message, given the way he presents it. He does not rule out some people as unworthy of his time or his effort or of hearing what he has to say because they live in the wrong place or they make the wrong amount of money or they hang out with the wrong crowd or they drive the wrong model of camel or they believe the wrong thing at that moment. Jesus knows of nobody who is of little to no use to him and his kingdom. Nobody. The sower Jesus talks about, and I have to thank the sower he wants us to be, is an extravagant sower. Jesus wants us gladly to throw seed everywhere, to throw him everywhere cover every kind of soil there is, and not by mistake, on purpose. Jesus knows there's plenty of seed to go around, and he also knows you never can tell in what unlikely spot a plant may take root against all the odds. If we're really casting Jesus everywhere, projecting Jesus, presenting Jesus everywhere, then the big variable that comes into play regarding the successful germination and growth of new Jesus plants, at least according to this parable, is the quality of the soil. I think we should call this parable the parable of the various soils. Let anyone with ears listen. In our passage from Paul's letter to the Romans today, Paul says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also. The tomb is like the shell of a seed. And resurrection brings that sprout to life in us. Are we good soil? Are we collectively good soil? I think we're pretty good here, but maybe I should knock on wood. Can we find the strength and the wisdom to do a little weed control? Does the seed of the word consistently take root in us and flourish and grow to be a strong plant filled with the Spirit of God? 
One of the things we can take great comfort in is that Jesus does, in fact, throw himself or cast himself at all different kinds of soil. And those different kinds of soil are us. If we know that we are a rock, we should put a little effort into helping God break us up so that the roots of his life can penetrate ourselves. Do you know that you keep your heart hard in some ways? Maybe on purpose? Maybe so you don't get hurt because you've been hurt before? Invite Jesus to break your heart in a good way. To let the Spirit dissolve your brokenness into good soil. It might hurt a little, but it's worth it. Are there weeds in your life competing with the tiny green sprout of the life of God that has taken root in you, but struggles for sunlight and water and fresh air? What are those weeds? Perhaps unnecessary busyness that doesn't allow time or energy to attend to your new sprout. Perhaps a bitter root of anger that has grown so deep that it'll be hard to pull. Yet you know that once it is pulled, that part of your life that it has been sucking all the energy out of will now finally be able to sustain some beauty and strength and connection as God's sprout grows in you. Do you think you lack the nutrients needed to support the life of that fledgling plant and you're afraid that it will grow up to look strange, be lopsided like a mutant of some kind? God supplies what we need there as well. Plan a little time in your scriptures every day. Some in the Gospels, some in the Psalms, some in other portions of the word to which you feel led. The word is soil too. If your digging raises questions, don't be afraid. Questions are just opportunities for more digging. The deeper we dig with God, the healthier our kingdom plants will be. And we often need to ask others who carry a well-worn shovel to help us dig. That's okay. Paul does say that there is no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but that's not an excuse for spiritual laziness. We can say, what a relief. We're saved in spite of the kind of people that we are sometimes. Yes, that's true. But our reward is diminished if we only focus on what happens after we die. Jesus came so that we can experience a more bountiful and rewarding life today. If we foster the life of the Spirit in us, we begin to reap life-giving benefits today. God will give life to our mortal bodies now, right now so that we can live a life more in tune with his kingdom that has already arrived, but that is also still coming. A fuller, deeper, more satisfying life is within reach. It surrounds us if we look. What kind of soil are we? Let's pray for God to be moving and breaking some rocks and pulling some weeds adding some black dirt to our gravel. Some water from the baptismal font wouldn't hurt either. The seeds of God's kingdom planted in good human soil will bear lots of delicious fruit. Let's allow the grand sower to cultivate our lives, to continue to cultivate our lives, so that the seeds of his life that he cast so generously in our direction will continue to take root in us deeply and we can bear fruit.
And now let's stand and affirm our faith as we say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, Father the Almighty, Almighty, maker Amen. of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten from not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified and Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and this kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy act and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead. of the people are formed for in the Book of Common Prayer beginning on page 388. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Guide our presidents in all who serve, the people of this land and of all the nations, in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and uh, to honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially Alex, Robert, Grant, Anna, Claire, Adam, Andrea, Jared, Joe, Ellen, Cervella, Linda, Eric, Wendy, Kyla, Steve, Jesse, Devin, Jason and Jennifer, Joanne, June, Jennifer, Bill, Doug, Philip, Byron and Melissa, David, Caden, Janet, Bob, Nancy, Steve, Zach, Bob, Selena, Tony, Dakota, 